Okay, everyone. So um, what we're focusing on for the second part of lecture today is small to large scale evolution. And I know that sounds a little bit abstract right now, but by the time we get done with lecture, I promise that will make a whole lot more sense. So as Darwin was coming up with his idea for evolution and natural selection, um, he didn't live in a vacuum, okay? And so he actually was well aware of other researchers and other scientists and what they were contributing. And so some of the people that influenced him were Georges Cuvier. Remember, he was a champion of catastrophism. That was the idea that you had extinction events um, with dinosaurs and so forth, which you should know this. And I kind of remember, I forgot to tell you. So the whole idea of, you know, having major catastrophes that happen through time, which was, was proposed by Cuvier with extinction events, that's known as catastrophism. All right. Then there was uniformitarianism, and we've talked about that extensively now that was proposed by Hutton and Lyell, okay? So both of those ideas influenced Darwin. And as I said, the whole idea of catastrophes and extinction, that kind of bothered him because he didn't really know at the time the mechanisms behind him or why that would happen. And again, we have a much better knowledge and understanding of this today. We also had, back in the day, um, a person named Thomas Malthus who believed in the idea of population regulation. And now, I've not read his work personally, but I've talked to people that have, and apparently it's actually kind of cold. And basically it says more people are around than will be able to survive, and poor will always be poor, which, you know, of course, in day and age doesn't happen. And so um, people have more opportunities than ever to be able to um, make a living and so forth. But this was, you know, back in the 1800s and before that. But the whole idea was that those that were able to have a struggle for existence and survive, those are the ones that would um, be able to keep going. Okay, and again, this is not a nice, um, uh, it's definitely not a nice theory. I definitely want to go back and read this for myself because I'm really curious about it, just to be able to make sure I'm interpreting it correctly based on what I have been told by others. But we learn from history, right? And so the whole idea is you don't forget it, you learn from it to make sure it never happens again. So we also had economics back in Darwin's day that influenced him. And so economics was written by a man named Adam Smith. And so Smith was a big proponent to have what's known as laissez-faire government, which means that the government doesn't interfere with economics, everything should just chug along the way it's supposed to, and so forth. So what I'm wanting you to get from this are the three different main branches that kind of, um, of ideas that influenced Darwin as he was coming up with his whole idea of natural selection and evolution. So, I don't remember if I've told you the story of Alfred Russell Wallace and Charles Darwin. Both men came up with the idea of natural selection. I've always said I wanted to write a book on the scandals of science, and to be honest, this is one example that would definitely make a chapter. And so, what happened was Charles Darwin sailed on the HMS Beagle. We've talked about this before. Um, his dad really wanted him to be a doctor, but then he went and observed a surgery, and I'm sure you can imagine that surgery back in those days with no anesthesia would have been a horrible thing to observe. Darwin was very mild-mannered, and with all of the screaming and blood and the horror, he basically walked out of there and never went back again, and honestly, I couldn't blame him. Well, he was going to school to be have a pastor and have his own country church. That's what his father envisioned for him. And so, but just as he was graduating and about to move on to the next stage um, with his undergrad degree, he learned of a ship called the HMS Beagle that was going on a voyage around the world. And so Darwin really wanted to go, but his father initially wouldn't let him. Well, Darwin was smart. And so he talked to his uncle and the uncle talked the father into letting him go. And not only that, but the father then paid for the voyage. Okay. So, um, Darwin sailed around the ocean, the HMS Beagle. Now keep in mind, I could not have done this journey. I'm, you know, I'm all about adventure and so forth, but this was not a luxury cruise. Okay. So this would have been having a hammock and so forth to sleep on, um, and having seasickness and all sorts of other things, you know, happen. So it was definitely a challenging journey. But when he came back, he thought about his data and his idea of evolution and so forth. And he sat on it and thought about it and sat on it and thought about it and sat on it. And then finally, um, he talked to it with other scientists like Charles Lyell, and so Lyell knew what he was thinking at the time. Well, about 20 years later, a scientist named Alfred Russell Wallace happened to be an aspiring scientist. Now, he was a very different person than Darwin. Um, Alfred Russell Wallace was a self-made man, and so he didn't have family support, so he had to make his living by going and sampling around the world. 
Well, he came up with the idea of natural selection on his own, and he then sent his paper to Lyell to be proofed, okay, um, and to share ideas with him. Well, this is where it gets sketchy. Apparently, Lyell then ran back to Darwin and said, hey, you better hurry up and publish your finding soon or someone's going to scoop you. And if you were in science, you know that that means someone publishes an idea right out from under you, um, even though you've been working on it. It's completely independently. It happens in science all the time. But as scientists, honestly, we dread it. Okay, so eventually what would happen is Lyell kind of set it up that both men were to present their papers to the Linnaean Society and they were supposed to share um, credit for it. Okay. Um, ironically enough, neither one ended up showing up. Darwin had lost his daughter, and so he was going through a rather tough time and couldn't even imagine going to a scientific conference. And then Alfred Russell Wallace, he was on a sampling uh, journey in a ship sank. <laughs> and so he imagine, if you will, you know, sampling for a couple of years and collecting all these samples and then having your ship sink. So um, fortunately for Darwin, he was insured, okay, so he did get paid for everything, but he lost everything, and ironically, he was the only survivor off of the ship at the time. Well, so he didn't show up to present his work either. So eventually, though, their work was presented, the papers were presented for them, um, and then Darwin would publish what is known as the Origin of Species, okay, which is based on having hypotheses and reaching conclusions and, de you know, deducing um, what was going on from the evidence that's presented with you. So that's the backstory. The sketchy part comes in the fact that Lyell never should have run to Darwin and told him, hey, you better get your stuff published, okay? Just because you're, you, when you're a reviewer, you're supposed to keep your mouth shut and pretend you never saw it. But, you know, it was what it was. Um, both men did technically come up with the idea and both men kind of published around the same time. Um, and, uh, you know, history is always interesting. The other thing I want you to consider is the fact that Darwin is actually always credited for the idea of evolution, and until recently, um, he tends to be the one that we think of. And you might be asking yourself why. Well, it might be because he was friends with those that were influential, it might be because um, Alfred Russell Wallace eventually missed his family so much that he started going to seances and stuff, and so then people started to doubt the validity of his ability as a scientist. You know, all that gets a little sketchy when you start doing stuff like that and it's not necessarily right um but it what you know it happened and so darwin does tend to be the one that was credited but really darwin and wallace should both be credited now what i want you to get from this is that darwin came up with four different parts to his theory okay and then additionally i want you to notice that the theories can be independent meaning you know they relate to science on their own but yet they also are collective meaning they work together quite nicely too Okay, so to realize, one of the things he suggested was that evolution has occurred. So all critters have descended with modification from a common ancestor. The second was that the chief agent of modification would be natural selection on individual variation. Okay, so that if an individual has good traits, they do better and have more kids. If they have bad traits, then they don't do well and don't have children. Okay. Third, there's supposed to be a three there, by the way, um, single species have diverged into two or more over time. This is known as speciation, okay? So that speciation occurs, and this can generate new life forms. It happens all the time, all right? Last but not least, know that most evolutionary change is gradual, okay? So there are times and events where things can happen pretty rapidly, but overall, it takes a while for things to take place like that. So you might be asking yourself, how does natural selection work? And I would say, aha, that is an excellent question. So you first off, you have to have individuals in a population that vary in phenotypes. And what that means is your population has variation. Think of how boring the world would be if everything was and everybody was the same, okay? Secondly, that you have certain phenotypes that result in the bears surviving better and either attracting mates or having more kids, okay? Third, that phenotypes have an underlying genetic basis. They have to be what's called heritable. So heritable means that your trait is passed on, your variation is passed on from one generation to the next. And last but not least, that your traits are passed on to offspring disproportionately. And so those that have better traits will have more kids, and therefore the next generation will have more of them, and those that have less good traits will not have as many children, if at all, and therefore, you know, the composition of your population changes through time. Now, I want you to find evolution. I think I told you this before, but if I haven't, write this down. Evolution is defined as changing gene frequencies through time, period. This is how we define evolution. So the gene frequencies in your population will change through time. Okay, and hopefully that should make sense.
So what I would like you to do now is pause lecture and come up with an example of natural selection. Okay, so pause, come up with an example, and then once you're ready, start up again and we'll address the second question. One example, by the way, for natural selection could be that you have um, a population of flowers and you have red flowers, the pink flowers, and white flowers. And let's say that your um, population, the red flowers are pollinated by hummingbirds and the white flowers are pollinated by hawk moths. Well, let's say you have a year where the hummingbirds are very in abundance and the hawk moths um, are almost non-existent. So what happens is your red flowers get pollinated way more and produce way more seed you know, than the white flowers do. And let's say you have a second year where that happens and maybe a third year. Well, eventually what happens is you start out with a population of red, pink, and white flowers, but because the only ones to get pollinated were the red plants, they were the ones to actually um, succeed. And so over time, your population gradually shifts from mixed in red, pink, and white to all just, you know, maybe pink and red or, you know, dark pink and red and so forth. So that's an example. And by the way, it's a real life example that exists on a plant called scarlet gilia. So if you guys are curious, look up scarlet gilia. What was still missing with the idea of natural selection? Remember, this is Darwin's time and he didn't know what a gene was. Okay, so he knew that things were carried on, but he didn't know in what form. He didn't know what DNA was. He didn't know what a chromosome was because he was doing his work independently. And if you will recall, we talked about Gregor Mendel ever so briefly, but Darwin and Mendel didn't know about each other. And so what was missing? Well, it was the genetics behind what was getting passed on. So eventually, by the 1940s, this is decades later, by the way, um, a scientist by the name of Julian Huxley came up with a term called the modern synthesis. So basically what this is, is the modern synthesis is when um, Mendel's genetics actually came together with Darwin's evolutionary theory. So basically Mendel's genetics explained how things were inherited from one generation to the next. Now, it took until the 40s for this to happen, guys, which took forever, which just proves that scientists don't always pay attention to the literature either. Although, to be fair, um, I think Mendel's work was published in German in an obscure journal that um, not that many people realized, you know, this was going to happen and so forth. But still, the 40s, come on, guys, what happened? <laughs> That's just neat. So when the modern synthesis did come along in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, there was a whole bunch of new fields of science that either benefited greatly or it would be invented because of combining genetics with, um, with uh, evolution, okay? One of them is population genetics. Now they have an entire field on population genetics and basically you're looking at the genetics but instead of individuals, you look at it on a population basis, all right? Another is called ecological genetics, trying to understand why ecology can influence genes. All right, speciation and systematics, this jumped forward greatly when the modern synthesis came along, as did paleontology, because people finally understood what was causing these different traits to get passed from one generation to the next. Some of the most influential biologists who would become famous in population genetics were Haldane, Fisher, and Wright. Here are pictures of them here, okay? So I always have to laugh at these pictures because you know they're staged. Um, you know, they're in their suit and ties, all right, for a reason. Um, so it's not like they're actually getting them in the field, which always makes me smile a little bit. But Sewell, Haldane, and Wright, and you guys don't have to really necessarily know these guys all that much detail. I know I've asked you to know some people before, okay, but um, in this case, they were just among the population geneticists that kind of helped launch the field into mathematics. And I always wondered if that was a good thing or a bad thing when I was a student, because I wasn't really mathematically inclined. But I will admit, I've come to appreciate it, you know, since I've um, taking more classes and so forth that, you know, despite the fact they added math to genetics, um, you know, some of their contributions were actually pretty awesome. So the forces of evolution are basically different um, components that will, you can think of it as forcing evolution to happen, okay? So natural selection isn't the only force that impacts populations. However, it is one of them. So the, one of the first forces we'll talk about, of course, is natural selection. And you might think of it as deterministic because you're starting out with um, individuals that might be less fit and others that are more fit. And over time, those that are more fit have more children and so forth, and so their traits gets passed on. But that's not the only force of evolution. We also have what's called random genetic drift. So we're going to talk more about this later on in the term, and I don't want you to really stress about it now. But what I want you to think about is if you happen to have genetic drift, you could have a population that just by chance um, 
has a small number of individuals. Okay, when you have a small number of individuals, stochastic, otherwise known as random, by the way, events will be more likely to affect them. So one example of this could, let's say you had your population of red and white flowers, okay, but let's say just by chance, only the white ones happen to um, cross that year, okay, in which case it's a random event for, um, we're going to set it up as a random event. So if only the white ones happen to cross and have offspring, then your population over time will change, okay? And it will go from white and red to just being having all white flowers, all right? So we'll talk more about random genetic drift, and there's actually a lot of good tutorials on this, and I think some of them are even the Amoeba Sisters, which I love the Amoeba Sisters. So when I share um, videos with you guys from the Amoeba Sisters, it's because I think they're awesome and they have a sense of humor, which is greatly missed a lot in science. So um, I think they have one of these, and I will... Um, definitely put that in the announcements too. Now mutations are a force of evolution because when you have mutations they give um, variation for natural selection to act upon, okay? Additionally migration, you can potentially have a situation where some birds fly in from someplace else and they bring new genes with them so your population evolves because now they have these new genes. The last two I'd like you to cross out because they're not that important. Basically what it is is non-random mating. So if you have red flowers that only cross with red flowers, then your population is going to have a bunch of red flowers, okay? Um, if you have white flowers that only cross with white flowers, and by the way, nature doesn't always work that cleanly, okay? It usually doesn't happen. Last but not least, and again, you don't have to know this one either, but I'm just going to tell it to you because it's interesting, is something known as meiotic drive. Now, there are actually segments of DNA, they're called jumping genes, and I want you to Google this, okay? I might even give you an extra credit point if you do. I want you to Google jumping genes, where they are segments of DNA that actually pull them out of one part of the genome and insert them in someplace else to try and get carried to the next generation. How cool is that, guys? I mean, it doesn't have the capacity to think. It's a segment of, you know, genetic material. There's no brain attached there. But it just actually goes to show how cool um, genes actually really are, okay? But because they do this during the process of meiosis, it's called meiotic drive. So look up jumping genes. I'll probably have an extra credits question somewhere for you guys to incorporate that. Um, but it's, you're not required to necessarily memorize that. But again, it's really, really cool. I mean no brain attached there and it still is trying to make sure that it gets carried to the next generation. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> I like my field. What can I say? <laughs> I will say my husband pokes fun at me a lot when I get super excited about stuff like this, but I just like to think of the fact that I like, you know, what I'm doing. So, um, uh, my husband was a jock in high school and I was a bookworm, so that tells you anything. <laughs> so, all right, speciation. So there's four different methods that you can have new species form. One is called allopatric, one is parapatric, another is sympatric. Oh, wait a minute, this is not the right slide. Okay, for right now, cross this slide out. Um, if yours says sympatric and then stasipatric, because that, that meant I uploaded the wrong lecture. So actually, nuke this slide, cross it out, and just go to the next one. These are the four methods that speciation can happen that I want you guys to know. And this naming system is much better and it makes a lot more sense. So let's actually talk through this. In all four of the examples, you start out with one original population. Now let's go through allopatric and I want you to read um, down the column of allopatric. So you start out with one population, you get a barrier that forms. Okay, so then your two populations become isolated from one another. And because of that, they genetically diverge. And then eventually what happens is even if that barrier disappears, if they were to come back together, they would not be able to cross and have fertile offspring. So they are two distinct species. That's allopatric. Okay. Peripatric involves a new niche and a um, isolation event. So you start out with one population. Let's say you have a couple of individuals that go off to this new niche, okay, and they form a new um, population and they become isolated. All right, so they're isolated and they have a new niche. Let's say you have a population of plants that some of them go off and land into a new area where there are contaminated mine tailings, which means there's a high lead or high mercury or something along those lines. They have to evolve to deal with that. Well, if those two populations were ever to come together again, they become so different that they are two distinct species and they could not mate. That's peripatric. So peripatric involves a new niche and isolation. Write that down. Allopatric just involves, just involves isolation. Parapatric is when you have one big population 
you have this new niche that's right next to it, but there's no isolation. Okay, but then these guys in the new niche start to do better in that niche, and they start to diverge genetically that even if they were to come back together, they would not cross. A great example of this are um, known as Rigolides. They are apple um, maggot fruit flies, and I know that sounds gross, but it's um, they're, they live in apples. Okay, and so what happens is um, they started out living in uh, crab apples, is what I'm, the term I'm thinking of. But then eventually, um, other apple trees and so forth were planted around the United States, and they had this whole new area to explore. So the crab apple trees could be right next to a, um, a regular apple tree, but the flies went and settled in the new trees, and then they diverged because it was a very different niche that even if they were to come together, they um, wouldn't be able to breed. Make sense? I hope. If not, tell me. Sympatric is when you have a original population, then you have some sort of genetic mutation. So what the easiest way to think of this would be like um, an inversion, and this happens in plants, it happens in fruit flies, it happens in all sorts of critters where you have a segment of DNA that flips, okay? They didn't change their location. They have this genetic anomaly, this mutation, that makes them very different, and because they're so different, they can't go back and cross with their original species again. Okay, so it happens within the population. That's what sympatric means, within the same area. Allopatric means you got a barrier. Peripatric means you have a new niche and a barrier. Parapatric means it's just a new niche, no barrier. Okay, make sure that these all make sense. Write this down in your own words. Don't just memorize what I'm telling you. Okay, so make sure to put in your own words, and if you have questions, let me know. So, a man named George Gaylord Simpson was one of the first people to sort of bring paleontology into the modern synthesis. The way he did this was that he applied population evolutionary thinking to the fossil record. Well, this sounds really weird and abstract, but what does it really mean? Well, let's go to the next slide. One way that Simpson made a difference was that before this time, people would look for differences in the fossil record, but they didn't really standardize it. And so Simpson was the first one to actually standardize it, and he called this formal unit of morphological change as a Darwin, okay? So I'm not expecting you to memorize this. Just realize that Darwin is a unit of change in the fossil record. The other thing, just to realize for those of you that have a burning passion with math, is that one Darwin is equal to natural logarithmic unit of morphological change in a population per one million years. This is all relative. Okay, so this will make a lot more sense when we go to the next slide in a second. So mammals actually, as a group in general, have evolved pretty quickly, okay, with some species having a rate of morphological change as high as 10 Darwins, all right? Now you compare that to other species, for example, like the horseshoe crab, which are known as a living fossil. So the horseshoe crab hasn't really changed over millions of years. So, you know, not even a unit of Darwin have these guys changed. So remember, everything's relative, okay? But this is how um, Simpson's contribution kind of changed what people were thinking. They were trying to quantify and put a unit on how much evolutionary change happens over time. Other concepts I want you to know that were contributed at this time by Simpson is that evolution is not orthogenic, meaning it's not directed to any one predestined, pre, bleh, goodness, predestined goal, okay, by some unknown force. Evolution just happens. Um, evolution isn't necessarily progressive. We've said this before. You don't always go from least complex to more complex, okay? That's not the way things work. There are some interesting patterns, though, and we're going to discuss one in the next few slides, that if you look at the fossil record over long periods of time, sometimes it might look progressive because it has these trends, but they can be reversed. That's the, that's the difference, okay? So let's actually talk about one of those examples, starting with the next slide. So horses belong to a group of mammals called ungulates, okay? And what makes ungulates unique is they're animals with hooves. So they have a hard covering that protect their toes. Now, this is really great when it comes to running because it gives them a lot of speed. So we're talking about critters like goats and sheep and horses and pigs and rhinos and all sorts of other good critters that happen to fall into this group. Equus is the only surviving genus in the once diverse family of horses. These guys used to have a whole bunch of different members of this group, but most all of them died off, okay? So these guys have a central digit, this is the third digit, by the way, of each foot that happens to be enlarged, and this is what um, forms that protective covering. 
Now, their teeth of this group were adapted for feeding on grass, and so they have high crowns and elevated ridges, and basically this helps them grind everything up. So these guys are really well suited for their environment and their diet. Now, the Hyraso theorem, basically these are the first horses, okay, and they're also known as Eohippus, and technically that means the dawn horse. These guys were not grazers, they were browsers, and there's a difference. So grazers happen to feed on grasses and so forth, and they graze. Browsers, though, tend to feed on shrubs and shrubby plants and so forth, and the Hyraso theorem was definitely different than the horses that exist today. They were very short and small. They had toes, by the way, so they had four toes on the front and three on the back. So their teeth, um, they're low-crowned. They have horse-like ridges. However, um, they were definitely not um, as developed as they are for grinding in the horses that exist today. So these guys were definitely the early precursors to the horses we know and love that exist around. So the way it worked with the horses going from four to just one hoof, okay, was that it's, this is a nice diagram because it really compares it to the human hand, okay? So the side toes became less important. Um, no horse ever really had a thumb, but over time there was a reduction, okay? And so if you look here, going from five to four to three to two to one, basically horses are always flipping us off. <laughs> Whether we tend to realize it or not. But again, the advantage of having this is being a lot quicker, being able to move faster, and if you're trying to outrun a predator, that's going to be really, really important. So here we have a nice diagram of the horse lineages through time, and you'll see at the very bottom is the oldest, and that's the Hyraso theorem, and then you go towards the top, and that's the modern day horse, and it shows you the new world versus the old world, okay? And so what I want you to get from this is that the light color, so that's not filled in, those are the grazers, okay? And you can see that they had many different branches, different species coming off, but most of them all went extinct. You get to the dark, and those are the grazers. So browsers first, Okay, then they evolved to be the grazers. And once again, the grazers, they eat the grass. Again, many different lineages. Now, this is a really cool part from an evolutionary perspective, kind of sad from a human perspective. If you look at the New World, New World as in North and South America, okay, and you look at the Old World, the New World did have a lineage that evolved here, okay, but they all went extinct. And so the horses that were endemic or native to North America all went extinct and that happened when humans arrived. So most, most likely we killed too many of them and ate too many of them. We do have horses here, though, and you will see that they actually all come from the old world. So let's think about this. The horses we have here, if they came from the old world, who brought them? The Spanish conquistadors, okay? So what happened is the conquistadors brought horses over with them because they wanted to ride them as they were exploring and so forth, and then some of them would get away, but they had this really great niche that was open because humans had just hunted all the other horses and their competitors, and so that's why we still have horses today. From a science perspective, again, isn't that absolutely fascinating? From a human one, I'm kind of sad that we ate everybody. <laughs> that's just me, but, you know, it's an interesting fact. So we've said this before, that there are patterns in the fossil record. Okay, and one of them is gradual change, where you just see lineages gradually change over time. The second is known as punctuated equilibrium, where you have rapid evolutionary change associated with speciation and then gradual change again. Okay, so um, it might seem as if it's not possible to have that quick of evolutionary rate changes, all right? But I'm going to give you an example in the next slide called Foraminifera, that actually illustrates this. And so, remember, gradual change, uniformitarianism, punctuated equilibrium, not much change, a whole lot of change, and then not much change. All right? So make sure this makes sense. And um, the gradual change should definitely make sense, but the punctuated equilibrium, we'll go through an example in the next few slides, and make sure it makes sense by the end of those slides, and I'll come back and reiterate it again. So the critters that provide a great example of punctuated equilibrium, write this down, are known as foraminifera, and they're spelled here. They're also known as forams for short. They're single-celled. They're protists, because scientists don't know what to do with them, so they chucked them in the protist group. Okay. Um, they have shells that can be preserved incredibly well, and they've been abundant in the fossil record for 540 million years, guys. They long have outlived us. And they're a pretty fascinating group. So their shells are divided into chambers, and this changes during growth. 
There's 4,000 species living in the world's oceans today. These guys are doing really, really well. Okay, so the study we're going to talk about, this is such a cool study for multiple reasons. Okay, so um, what scientists did is they used cores from the bottom of the ocean. And so what they did was they drilled into the bottom of the ocean, they pulled the sediments up and kept everything in order. Now, there's so many different awesome things about the study. The first one is they have a fossil record for 10.4 million years, okay? It's a continuous fossil record for 10 million years. That's so cool. We never have this type of data as scientists, all right? Then what they did was they pulled out all the forams that they could find in those sediments, okay? So they kept sampling them. Then what they did is they took measurements of the shell shape, okay? Now, for those of you that are statistics people, they put these measurements into what's called an eigenvalue, and you probably know what an eigenvalue is. If you're not a stats person, let's talk. So what an eigenvalue is, is they took all the variation from the shells, and instead of having like 50 different measurements to compare against um, they put it in one value for that shell. So each shell has a unique value that takes into consideration everything they measured, and that's all you have to know, okay? Now what I want you to look at is how the fossils changed through time. So start at the bottom at the 10.4 million years. You can see that there's some variation, which is why, you know, there's an average, that's the mean, and that's the dot in the middle for all those different time points. And then there's variation, okay, that's the line on either side of that dot for all those different time points that were sampled. And what I also like about this diagram is they actually added some pictures in to kind of show how things change too. You can see that the shells started out relatively small, okay, and pretty symmetrical. Then as you're going through time, so you're moving upward, Okay, you can see that there's not a whole lot of change, and then all of a sudden, whoosh, you get a whole ton of change, and the shell's eigenvalues shift to the right. Okay, then what happens is they kind of bounce along again, and they move towards upward to where they exist today. One of the things to obviously change was size. Okay, and by the way, that box on the bottom uh, right corner is just a blown up version of what you see where all of those data points are collected right above it. Okay, so What's so cool about this? Well, first off, 10.4 again, million years of fossil record, very cool. Secondly, there is some individual variation in these populations, which is kind of what you would expect. But things don't evolve very quickly. Then all of a sudden, they shift to the right, okay? And then they start to bounce around a little bit again, but a whole not a lot of change, you know, from around what? Uh, one, two, three, four, five million years and up. Okay, so they've basically, it's stasis, things kind of the same whole bunch of change, and then stasis as you go through time, okay? And that's why this is so cool, because it's such a great example of punctuated equilibrium. Not much change, whole lot of change, not much change, okay? So make sure that you can, you know, you get an idea of how things have changed. The, dot, the drawings should definitely help. And again, whenever you see a graph, all you do is read the axes, okay? And it should be no big deal, because we've already talked about this, so this should totally make sense. If you have questions, please let me know. So, the 4M fossils illustrate, first off, the rate of evolution in lineages will vary through time. Not a whole lot of change, a lot of change in a short amount of time, and then a whole lot of not much change again for 5 million years. The shape of the shell was seldom consistent. There was definitely variation in each of the times those were measured, and that was what you would expect. The shape varied among the critters. Again, got to have that variation. Okay, and then the species evolve rapidly from one relatively stable phenotype, phenotype is what it looks like, to another relatively stable phenotype. Okay, so this is what the forums illustrate, and this is why this is such a cool example. So you might be asking yourself, what in the world would cause this? Okay, well, you could have stable conditions for a long time period, and then what's known as adaptive radiation, where things shift really quickly, and then more stable time periods. That's one possibility. Okay. Maybe there was um, what's known as developmental homeostasis, meaning that they couldn't change much as they were developing, okay? And then you get these crazy speciation events that happen in the middle. That's another possibility. Maybe it was the physiology constraining the species, that they just didn't have the genetics or the physiology to be able to change much. Then you might ask yourself, what would lead to a speciation event? Well, what if the environment shifted relatively rapidly? Because that could totally do it. Now, a great way <clears throat> to apply this, <clears throat> if you wanted to, <clears throat> hint, <laughs> okay, <laughs> can you come up with your own example of punctuated equilibrium? 
doesn't have to be a real one. Could be a different scenario that you happen to come up with. Could, de could deal with, you know, pink dragons with purple polka dots. I don't care. But just come up with an example of your own and maybe an example of what might cause it. This is a great way to apply something, apply a concept, okay, rather than just memorizing what I've told you. Hint, hint. So everything we've dealt with up to this point is known as microevolution. Microevolution, meaning it's evolution at the population level. But now we're going to go one step above that to a concept called macroevolution. Now, when I was in grad school <clears throat> a bazillion years ago, <laughs> okay, um, the whole idea of macroevolution, macro whether or not it even existed, was very controversial. I think scientists these days have kind of agreed that it probably does exist, but it's kind of hard to prove, okay? Macroevolution means you're dealing with evolution above the species level. Okay, so, and the way this works is if, you're, if your lineage is successful from a macroevolutionary perspective, it will survive through time, and there will be a whole bunch of new species that form from it. That means it's successfully from a macroevolution perspective. If it's unsuccessful, that means everybody goes extinct. Okay, now I realize this might be hard to conceptualize, so let's actually put up some pictures and talk through a couple diagrams, because I promise it will help it make more sense. Now, one example of a successful macroevolutionary event is in the horses. We started out with Hyrasotherum. Many um, different branches came off. Some of them went extinct. Some of them still exist. Okay. Um, however, overall, these guys kept going. All right. And so from a macroevolutionary perspective, they were successful. That's a successful example. Now, an example of an unsuccessful lineage from an evolutionary perspective would be the trilobites. Now the trilobites, super cool, love these guys. I have a couple of trilobite fossils myself because I think they're so cool. Um, unfortunately, they all went extinct though at the end of the Permian. So 250 million years ago, that's when they kind of bit the dust. So um, again, from a macroevolutionary perspective, everybody's gone. Okay, so they are not successful. So this whole macroevolutionary concept means you have selection going on at the species level. So traits that are being selected for at the species to either make them more successful, where you have more lineages that survive, or more species that are produced and survive, or less successful, where they all go extinct. And the question is, is how do you show this? Okay, like what traits are even controlling this, and how do you, you know how does this differ from from selection at the population level? Well, remember, that's microevolution that only happens at the population level. And this is kind of tricky, and it's a little bit abstract. So I want you guys to just relax and breathe with this, okay? So, again, macroevolution, same thing as species-level selection. If they're successful, more species are produced. If they're not, less species are produced. And the traits that do this, okay, that are sort of responsible for this to happen... Well, you have to show that it's, you know, this trait is definitely tied to either them becoming more species or everybody going extinct. It's a tough thing to actually show. You also have to show that whatever trait you're looking at that you think might be responsible for this is not actually just microevolution happening at the bigger scale. The other thing you have to do, which is why it's tricky, is you have to show that whatever trend you're seeing is not due to the fossil record, the fact there's so much bias in it. Okay, and again, I realize this is abstract, but let's actually talk about a couple of examples that have been proposed to be linked to macroevolution where species have become more successful. And then once we talk about that, I think it will make more sense. Now, there are four different traits that are currently proposed, or four different um, mechanisms that are proposed to be responsible for macroevolution. So the first one is the large body size in mammals. So over time, mammals have really increased to a larger body size. So another name for that, by the way, is called Cope's Law, and we're going to revisit that in two slides. Don't worry about writing it down now, but just put Cope's Law in the back of your mind. If you think back to the horses, they started out as a hyraso theorem that were really tiny, but then eventually the horses we know and love today are really big. Okay, so what are some advantages that might have? Well, if you're really big, you can outrun your predators. Other critters might not be able to eat you once you're a larger size than if you're a smaller size. Okay, so that's one proposed mechanism for macroevolution. And then the horses, it seems to be true. The evolution of sex, and I'm talking about the boring kind, okay? So um, from a boring perspective, we're dealing with plants, although plants are awesome and not boring, just for the record. 
Um, however, okay, being able to reproduce sexually from an evolutionary perspective is a big deal because then you have genetic variation which natural selection can act upon. If you go, if you completely reproduce asexually, okay, well that's not a good thing because of everybody's the same. Now, the, the um, proposed successful lineage that this um, influenced, by the way, were the angiosperms, and those are the flowering plants. So the angiosperms, um, you know, that they reproduce through sexual reproduction, and it's those flowering plants, which then ties us to our next proposed mechanism is the fact that the angiosperms came about, and they have this really cool partnership with insects to where the insects act as their pollinators, and they will go from plant to plant to plant and pollinate that plant, okay, um, because the angiosperms produce these really great flowers. Okay, so we have three potential explanations slash mechanisms so far for macroevolution to take place. So larger body size in mammals, as illustrated by horses, go back to look at the figure a couple slides ago if you need to, and you'll see that the horses increase in, in size. Sexual reproduction, because it produces genetic variation that, that evolution can act upon. And last but not least, angiosperm uh, and their pollination with insects. Okay, that partnership that they have, that also explains it. Last but not least, a lot of species learned how to avoid predators based on behavior. Even the tiniest of ones do. Okay, and so even when the tiniest critters started to learn how to avoid predators, from an evolutionary perspective, that most like, likely led to them being super successful, you know, and having a whole bunch of new species form that could, again, outsmart their predators. So let's quickly wrap up, um, not wrap up totally, but at least... Um, revisit a few things. So we know that evolution is not necessarily directional, but you can see trends, okay? So there's evolutionary change that persists long enough that you can detect it in the fossil record. So again, the one example, the increased body size and lineages over time that definitely happened with the horses and a whole bunch of the other mammals. Because remember, all the mammals started out super small when the dinosaurs existed because they were trying to hide and not get eaten. So that increasing body size, again, is Cope's law, and here we have it spelled out here, okay? So the Hyrasotherium, those guys were really tiny. Then, you know, 12 million years ago, the Equus evolved. They had a much larger body size. That's known as Cope's law, okay? And um, the scientists have to name everything. They just do. So the fossil record is complex, and I want to bring up one last point, okay? And that's that what you see in the fossil record may not always be 100% accurate. So for this scenario, we're going to pretend. We're going to pretend that we can see flower color, okay? And so let's say you have a fossil record and you notice some flowers that reproduce asexually, okay? And you see them in the, um, in the fossil record as red, all right? Well, over time, they do really well and they evolve, then they turn to yellow, okay? And again, we're pretending we can see color in the fossil record. Well, what's really going on as far as these guys evolving over time is they went from asexual reproduction to sexual reproduction, okay? However, all we see is this shift in the fossil record from red flowers to yellow flowers, and so we think, oh, it's the flower color change that's making the difference. So what's going on, sorry for the calendar reminder, I'm supposed to be putting your lectures together for you guys tomorrow. <laughs> Anyway, starting out with red flowers in the fossil record, because we're pretending we can see color, okay, in the fossil record, which we can't, and then going to yellow flowers in the fossil record, and we think, oh, it's the switch from red to yellow flowers that makes them more successful. Well, that's not actually the case. What's going on and making them more successful throughout history is they went from asexual reproduction to sexual reproduction. So the yellow was not necessarily what was being selected for. It just happened to be in the sexually reproducing populations. They happened to be doing better, so this yellow color was actually hitchhiking along. Okay, And I'm not trying to, again, shoot down the fossil record, but I want you guys well informed with what the limitations of the fossil record are and what we can actually infer. All right. So what I'm going to do next, um, we're done with lecture for Monday. Okay, and so, but I want to make sure that you guys are not overwhelmed, that things are going okay for you. So if you guys are getting stressed out and you're feeling like this is too intense, I want you guys to let me know and I will do my best to accommodate you. Okay, I know summer term moves quickly. This is supposed to be a fun class and I want you guys to be learning. So if you could just give me a heads up in an email and let me know how things are going for you and, you know, let make sure everything's going okay. Um, I would greatly appreciate it. I know everything is just crazy right now with even having to be online. That's why I'm trying to gauge how things are going and the fact we're moving twice as quick.
So if you guys just could send me an email, I would greatly appreciate it. Okay. So I wish you a wonderful rest of your Monday. Um, and I will talk to you again on Wednesday. And if you need me, please let me know. Stay safe, everybody.